Right. I am watching the clock, but uh, I hope you have something not brewing in the oven. Okay. All right. Guys, I have something I want to share with you. We're going to begin today a, a, a new series. Um, it'll run for six or seven weeks. We're not quite sure right now, but uh, I hope that it's going to be a blessing. It's a very simple theme. There are some themes and some words that just seem to reoccur in the Bible time and time again, and they kind of stand out to us as, as something that maybe we should pay a little bit of attention to. One of those words is simply the word stand, to stand. And uh, there are many referrals to the word stand in the Scriptures, and we're going to look at a number of them. We're going to look today at stand firm. We'll be looking at, in the days to come, at stand out. We'll be looking at standing up. We'll be looking at standing in. We'll be looking at standing together. It's, it's, a, it's a really great theme. Now, I remember a, a while back I, I, I did a, a sermon, a one-off sermon, simply called Stand, and we based it upon a, a poiki pot. Do you remember? Well, I'm back to the poiki pot. I'm back to the poiki pot. And for a good reason. The poiki pot stands because they say that three legs is, is, is better than four. Less is more in this particular case. Although two is not as good as three and the thing will fall over. Three legs is a picture of, of real stability in, in anything. So I want to use the poiki pot that we uh, have up here. Heather's drawn me another lovely poiki pot. And I want to use this every time we speak about some aspect of stand. And we're going to pick up on three aspects of what makes that aspect cause us to, to stand. So today I want to pick up on, on, the, on the fact of, of what it means to stand firm. Why don't you turn in the Bible, please, to Ephesians chapter 6. It's a great passage. It's one that uh, I'm sure you all are, are familiar with, Ephesians chapter 6. And it's toward the end of this amazing book that the Apostle Paul begins to, to write on this particular theme. I want to read to you, if you're okay, with verse from verse 10. And uh, we'll go through until I think we kind of end it there. Number 10, verse 10. This is what Paul says on the subject of standing firm. He says, finally, this is like a, the final word. After everything else has been said and done, Paul says this, finally, be strong in the Lord and in His mighty power. Put on the full armor of God. Don't put on half of it. Put on the full armor of God so that you may be able to take your stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Therefore, put on the full armor of God, so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to what? Stand your ground. And after you have done everything to stand, stand firm then with the belt of truth buckled around your waist, with a breastplate of righteousness in place, with your feet fitted with a readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. In addition to all of this, take the shield of faith, which can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the ill one. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of spirit, which is the word of God, and pray in, all, pray in the spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. With this in mind, be alert. Always keep on praying for all the saints. People, he's telling us about what it means to stand, and in this particular instance, to stand firm. Stand firm. So I'm going to put in here that we need a stand. And our picture here. Stand firm. That's what this poiki pot is all about. Now, there are two aspects that I want to pick up, and I'm going to ask you to listen very carefully. First aspect is that of the stance of one who stands. Have you ever seen a boxer in the ring? There's a particular stance that they have. I want to talk about the stance of believers who are ready for the spiritual war that we are embarking upon or the one that we are already in. There's a particular stance that Christians take ready for this warfare. The next thing I want to talk about is the substance upon which we stand. Because your, the stance that you take will only be as good and as powerful as the substance upon which you take the stance. So if you're making your stance upon quicksand, you're going to have the best stance and the best pose in the entire world. It's not going to get you anywhere because of the substance upon which you stand. So today I want to talk about the stance and I want to talk about the substance. Now, you can tell a lot, apparently, about people by their body language. 
You know, there are books written about this. You can Google a whole lot of stuff if you enter that about body language. Some scientific people have found it fascinating to see how we, we speak with our bodies. And we tell people messages through the way that we stand. For instance, if you're talking to me and I stand like this at 45 degree angle to you with my arms folded, I don't like you. I don't like you at all. I'm wishing you would just go away. So watch out for that stance. Okay. But, it, but if, 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 if you're a guy and wanting to know if the girl likes you, then just watch how they sit. You know, if, you, if you're sitting over here, then the girl will sit like this. Huh? Is this part of the Am I wrong? But Brit, you need it. You, don't watch Brit down the front. That's exactly right. You know, you, you can tell a lot by the body language. Apparently, apparently if, if I'm questioning you and you start to rub your, your nose, you're lying. And if you blink too often, you're lying even more. So, so what, I know all this stuff, so you can't get away with this stuff from me. But it, there, there, is, there is so much sense in you can read so accurately what a person is, is thinking or doing or feeling simply by their body language. Now, in this t- context of what we talk about, there is a particular pose of body language that, that true believers should have. I'm not saying if you're a true believer and you don't have this, that you're not a believer, but I do believe that if you're a believer, you need to have this particular stance. And it's very simple, and I don't want to talk all that long about this. But I do believe that the believer's stance should be one that is ready, but is relaxed. Is ready, but relaxed. He's ready for the battle. He's ready for it. But in his heart, he is totally relaxed. In his, in his body, in his physics, he's looking like he's ready for the fight. He's ready for it to go. But in his mind, he is totally relaxed because he knows that he's on the winning side. He knows that he is going to win. He even knows this, that if he loses the fight, he will still win the war. Because sometimes we do lose certain battles along the way. But a true believer's stance is a stance that says, I'm ready, but man, I'm relaxed. Because I have the Lion of Judah to fight against all the wolves of the the world around me. The lion will always chow the wolves. You do know that. And when you understand that, it brings to you an incredible confidence. We could talk for hours about David when he stood in front of Goliath, remember? Totally ready for the battle. He had his stone. He had his five stones. He had his slingshot. He was ready for the battle, and he took on an aggressive stance against this nine-foot giant. But in in his mind, he was totally relaxed, and he told the giant that. The giant came and said, what entitles you to fight me, you little pipsqueak? Who do you think I am? Am I just a dog? And he says, you have defied the name of Jehovah, my God, and he today will deliver you into my hand. I am totally relaxed, is David, although his stance is one of apparent aggression. Now, that's kind of like the stance that we should have. Think again of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. We learn so much from these little biblical stories, man. They're beautiful. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego stood in front of the king, having not bowed to his statue. And the king says, hey, guys, don't you want to change your stance? Change your stance from this stance to bowing stance. And they said, king, we will never change our stance. We will never bow to you because we will only bow to Jehovah, our God. That is our stance. So he says, but I'm going to throw you into the fire if you don't bow. They said, no, we don't care. Totally relaxed. They said, hey, you know, if you throw us into the fire, O king, we, we could all be burnt up. That would be okay. But if our God we know is able to deliver us. So, so we win both ways. And their stance was totally relaxed because of the confidence they had in, in God. Now, Ephesians 6, verse 14 and 18, is all about getting ready for this, this stance. You see, you don't just arrive. You've got to wear the right kit in order to be... St- and he's very specific of what the, about what this kit looks like. He talks about the helmet of salvation. He talks about the breastplate of righteousness. You've got to put that stuff on. He talks about the belt of truth. He talks about the shoes shod with the readiness of the gospel. He talks about the shield of faith. And he talks about the sword of the Spirit. When you have got those things on it, we could preach a number of sermons just on that theme alone. But when you have got that, then you are ready for the battle that is going to come your way. You are ready now to take up the stance, and because you have everything that you need, you will be relaxed in your mind knowing that you're prepared for the battle. I think we lose too many battles because we're unprepared for them. 
we go in with a sense of arrogance, saying, I'm going to win this battle of temptation against this. And what happens? We lose. And we wonder, why did I lose? Is God lost his power? Why did I lose this battle when I said, I come in Jesus' name to address this temptation or this issue or whatever it is that you're facing in your life? The reason is you've come unprepared. Before you start taking on aggressive stances, you better make sure that you have the right equipment. And it's very specific about what that looks like. And I think that this attitude of relaxed kind of speaks of two things. The relaxed person in the battle is always the most courageous. Uh, I think we're too often like the wimps, Christian little wimps. We're apologizing all the time for the fact that we're in a spiritual war. We're, we're apologizing for this aggressive stance that we take against a thing called sin. We're continually on the back foot. I don't think that's a biblical stance at all. I see people standing with courage. I see Esther crossing into that line, across that line into the presence of the king. And if I perish, I perish. Courageous words. So with the stance and the mind now is this going on of how relaxed I am because I come with courage. I also come not just with an attitude of courage, but I come with total confidence that I cannot lose the war. I know I said just now you may lose one or two little battles along the way. That's okay. That's okay. Just pick yourself up, dust yourself off, and get back in the fight again. You can lose a couple of battles, but at the end of the day, you can, I believe, like David, win the war. Totally ready, but totally relaxed. That's the stance of the believer. Let's talk about the substance of the believer. The substance, I said, is only as good as the substance upon which it stands. These three legs are critical, and they need to be standing upon something that is firm and something that is hard and something that is good. When you make a poiki, you don't want to make a poiki and something's going to fall over because you kind of lose all the value of what you, you do. And so it's a, it's a silly, simple picture, but I cannot think of a better one. The substance upon which we stand is vitally important. Now, I want to talk about these three legs here because they, in essence, speak to us of this substance. The first aspect of this, this substance is found in the fact of the person of God. Let's put a name to this leg here. This leg we would call the person of God himself. I don't know about anybody stronger than God. Do you? I don't know anybody better to build a foundation on than God. He's always stood firm. He stood the test of time. He will not change. And when the first leg of your poiki is standing upon the person or the personality or the character of God, you, I have to tell you, that thing will never be shaken. Bring anything on from Satan, the world, temptation, anything. It will always stand if it is built on the person of God himself. Not upon your own strength, not upon your own wisdom, not upon your own ability to do stuff, but upon a person of God, the person of God himself. Now there's a couple of things you need to know about this God. We call them, in biblical terms, we call them attributes. It's just a theological word for characteristics of who God is. Because it's very easy for me to use, say to you today, you must build your life upon God. And you say, yeah, yeah that, that, that's cool. Let me tell you a few characteristics of this God who I'm encouraging you to build your life upon. The first thing we all know is what? Is that God is, is love. You know that. God is love. He can't help it. He doesn't just do loving things. God is love. That means no matter how gross your sin may become, no matter how bad your life may turn out to be, it will never affect the fact that God loves you. We think I have to earn God's love. You don't have to earn anything because God is love. He can't help it but love you. He can't help it that even though you shake your fist in His face and people walk away and people disobey, you can never not have God loving you. Hey, that's a great foundation for the first aspect of who God is. He can't help it. He is love. What about a second attribute? What about the fact that God is unchanging and totally consistent? God is not like us. We change like the wind. We're completely inconsistent. If I look back at things that were meaningful 
three years ago, and they're no more longer meaningful now because we change. God does not tr- have a problem with that. God just, he just doesn't change. Now, we live in a world of, of, of contingency where so much in our world is living according to the word if. If. We say, I will live another 10 years if I don't get sick and die. Okay. We say this. We say, we will retire in comfort one day if, if there's not another stock exchange crash. Everything in our lives revolves around if. We will be safe and secure in our country if the armed forces of our country keep up to date and keep protecting us. I will, I will get up next, next tomorrow and I will go to an appointment in town and if, if, if I don't get hit by the proverbial bus. There are so many ifs in our lives and it's kind of like a contingency that so much is dependent upon the word if. It's not like that with God, at all with God. We would never say of God, God will continue to be if certain things happen down here on earth. <laughs> God is going to continue to be no matter what happens down here on earth. We would never in our, in our wildest dreams ever say, God will continue to be able to do da-da-da-da. That's never going to change. God is able to do whatever He wants to do. There are certain things that are not affected, that do not affect God, and they're, they're all kind of preempted with the word if. God is not who He is determined by circumstances around Him. He is who He is, has always been that way, and will forever be that way, no matter how many ifs and buts you throw into the pile. That's the nature of who God is. What about this? God is, is not just loving. He's not just, you know, he's not just consistent and, and unconditional. He, he, he's, he's also totally ethical. I found this interesting. I was reading up on this yesterday. And there's a, a beautiful picture of, of God as the, the epitome of, of good ethics and good morals. But just have a look at his ethics for a moment. If you want to make, here's the deal. If you want to make a good ethical decision in your businesses, in your lives, you, you, here, here's what you have to do. Three things. The first thing is you have to have knowledge of what to do. You've got to have knowledge of what to do. In the context as it relates to God, this is God's wisdom. God is never short of knowing what to do. He knows exactly what He wants to do. The second thing you have to do to make an ethical decision is you have to have the ability to do it. I cannot make an ethical decision on behalf of my government because I don't have the ability or the wherewithal or the voice to be able to make that, that, that ethical decision. I can shout, scream, and blow bubbles about ethics to the government, but I can do nothing because I have no ability. God does not have that problem either. God has total wisdom. He knows what He needs to do. He has the total ability to do it. And here's the third thing about ethics. You have to have the will to do it. God is all three. He has total power. He has total wisdom. And He is totally good. And He chooses to do always that which is right. What about, what about some of the omni-attributes of the foundation who is God as a person? You know the omni-attributes? We talk about God being omnipotent, which means He has all power. We talk about God being omniscient, which means He has all knowledge. We talk about God being omnipresent, which means that there is nowhere where God is not. He is everywhere. I want to read to you quickly from Psalm 139. This is my favorite psalm in the whole book, and I, 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 I just love it passionately. Psalm 139 speaks of these three attributes of God. Let me go through it. First of all, he says, O Lord, you have searched me and you know me. You know when I sit down and when I rise. This is the omniscience of God. You perceive my thoughts from afar. You discern, God, my going out and my lying down. You are familiar with all my ways. Before a word is on my tongue, you know it completely, O Lord. There is nothing that God does not know. Then he moves on to speak about the omnipotence of God. He says, sorry, the omnipresence of God. Where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? If I go to the heavens, you are there. If I make my bed in the depths, you are there. If I rise on the wings of the dawn, if I settle on the far side of the sea, even there your hand will guide me and your right hand will hold me fast. 
And then he talks about the omnipotence of God. And he says, how precious are your thoughts. He says, you created my inmost being. That's power. You knit me together in my mother's womb. That's exceptional power. I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works, all of them, are wonderful. And I know that full well. People get this. This is the rock of the first leg upon which we need to build so that our faith can stand firm. You start here. You need to build your faith upon who God is. Not just what God can do or what God has said, but upon the character and the essence and the attributes of God. Have you got that? You've got to get it. Second thing, the second leg. We've spoken about the, the, the person of God. Let's talk about, let's name the, this, this back leg at, at the moment here, the promises of God. God has made certain promises. Read the scripture and you will see them all over the place. One of the other attributes, and these are all linked from the promises of God, is to the person of God, being God being totally faithful. God does not say one thing and do another. God does not make a promise to you and change his mind. If God makes a promise to you people, it's a promise based upon the person of who he is. And in that person, in that character, in those attributes, God is totally faithful. If you have received that promise from God, and there are wonderful promises, and you can take some from Scripture, some God gives to you personally as you meet with them and you share with them. You can hold on to They are like signed checks. You can, God has signed that check and says, this will forever be a promise to you. There's a big word that we use in the Bible, and we call it the word covenant, which is the highest order of promise. Now, humanly speaking, there were certain covenants that people went into to deepen certain relationships. The ultimate covenant of all was what they called the blood covenant, because the blood covenant is a promise sealed with blood. That's how seriously it is. A promise that is sealed with your own blood, saying, if I break this promise, then you can take my life. And I will lay down my life for the fulfillment of this promise. We see that in Jewish culture, the beauty of the blood covenant. Have you seen that? Where two people will enter into a covenant that culminates in them cutting themselves on their wrists and they mingle the blood. And then they, they have a scar there that reminds them continually that I have a covenant partner. Well, God has that. And his, your name is written on the palm. It says your name is engraved on the palm of his hand. He cannot forget you. He has made a promise to you. He doesn't just made a promise. He's made a covenant with you that is sealed with his blood. That's how serious God is about fulfilling his promise. He's not like us. We don't honor signatures. Never mind sealing with blood. God seals it with his blood. And he did that over the past, over the Easter time, where we remember his sacrifice to us. You know, as you look at the Bible, you will see anybody who was ever anybody understood that when God told them to do something, that was as good as a promise. If God said to you, I want you to go from here and to do a particular thing, you knew that God was not telling you to do that just to mock you or to see you fail. God, with the instruction, always gave a promise. But it's these promises that anybody who is ever anybody in Scripture understood that that's all they needed. When God stood with, with Moses at the burning bush and Moses fell down in front of the burning bush and God said, Moses, get up, go to Pharaoh, I will be with you and I will, I will take you through this thing. He didn't need to go for counseling on that. He didn't need to call a, a group of advisors on that whole deal to say, do you think this is wise that I should go? I, God has said this to me. Do you, what do you guys think? When you have just the promise of God, people, you have enough. You have it all. You visualize Joshua on his way to Jericho. And you say, Joshua, where are you going? And he says, no, God has told me to take down that big city with that huge wall around. And they say, Joshua, haven't you seen how big the city is? Haven't you got a, have you got an army? Have you got dynamite? How are you going to take that wall down? Joshua, that's far too big. How, what do you think you're doing? And he says, I don't need all that stuff. All I need and have is a promise 
of God. That's all you need. When you hear the voice of God telling you to do something, all you need to have is His promise. That's it. Promise is enough. It's not a promise plus resources. It's not a promise plus good management. It's just the beauty of simply a promise. Thing number three. We have the person of God Himself, the promises of God. I want to take this one and talk about the precepts of God. Or maybe a better word would be the principles of God. You see, the precepts will tell you what the principles are. The principles of God are kind of set in concrete. You do know that. Kind of like gravity. Gravity is not going to change just because you don't believe in it. The principles of God are just like that. They are there and they're, they're there forever. In 2 Thess- Thessalonians 2 verse 15, this is what the writer says. He says, stand firm. There we go. Stand firm and hold to the teachings that we have passed on to you. You see, the promises of God are backed by the person of God. But here's the deal. The precepts of God are not so much backed by the person of God as they are backed by the will of God. Now, you've got to get this. You've got to get this. As you read the Bible, be very, very careful about grabbing principles and saying, if God says this and then He says He will do that, that I can hold to that as it being a promise. It's not a promise. It's a principle. If you have a look at the book of of, uh, Proverbs, Proverbs is full of principles for godly living. And they would appear from the outset, from the outside, to kind of look like promises. Let me read a couple to you, and you tell me if you see the fulfillment of these, these principles being promises. Whoever gives heed to instruction prospers. That's not a promise. That's a principle. If it were a promise, every time you heeded instruction, there would be blessing, and everything would go well for you. But I've got to tell you, there are times that I haven't heeded God's instruction, and there has not been the blessing. In fact, it gets you into trouble, because it's not a promise. It's a principle that if you apply it more times than not, it will become what God has said it will. But you cannot take principles and turn them into promises because promises are determined by the person of God. The principles and the precepts are determined by the will of God. Otherwise, we would just live mechanically through all these things. We would be able to hold God to ransom To say, God, you have said that if I trust you and obey you, that you will make me plentiful and you will abound and I will have all that stuff. You know, people, that's up to the will of God. It's not a promise. It's a principle. And the outcome of that principle is going to be determined by the will of God for your life. So don't get upset if you live out a principle of God and you don't get what it says at the end of the principle. What about this one? Proverbs 12 verse 7 says, Wicked men are overthrown. And no more. But the house of the righteous stands firm. You just got to go north of our border to see that this principle is not being experienced by many people in its totality. That's because it's determined, the fulfillment of it is determined by the will of God, not the person and the character of God. You go north of our border and there are wicked men who are not overthrown. And you still are. And the righteous are not standing firm in the, life, the context of their lives. It's, it's chaos. They're being, they're being killed. They're getting taken their jobs away from them. It doesn't look all that hot for them there. You know why? Because that's what God's will is at this particular time for those particular people. So beware, people, that you don't take principles and turn them into promises. Because principles are determined by the beauty of the goodness of God as it is manifest in His will for your life. No matter what happens, let me tell you this, God is still very, very good. Because goodness is part of who He is. God cannot do a cruel thing. God cannot do an unkind thing. He doesn't have the capacity to do that. God is good in everything. Do not ever think that God gets mean with you. He doesn't. Everything He does, He does out of the root of the character of His goodness, His kindness, His mercy, His grace, and His love. You've got to get that. Now, 
when you're you know, closing off now, in order to stand firm on this, you need all three. It's good that you have one. You're on the way there. It might be good you have two, but my plea with you today is that you would look to have a look at this and, and say, Whatever, what first of all is my stance as a believer? Am, am I ready, but am I relaxed in the knowledge that I will win this thing? Have I put on the armor of God as explained there? Am I building my stance and the stand firm that I want upon the substance of, of who God is, what God has promised, and the principles of God that are determined by His will, not necessarily as a promise? If you people, hey man, if you people can take this thing away with you, look at it this week and say, this is what I plan to do. I will stand firm, not in my strength, but in the person of who God is. I will stand firm with the assurance that God promises will never fail. And I will stand firm in the understanding that His principles are determined by His will. You got it. Let's pray. God, thank you for your interest in our lives. Thank you that we can stand firm in the knowledge that you are God. Thank you that you are the substance upon which we can take our stance. Your person and your character are all perfect. Your promises are totally secure. They are signed checks. And your principles are so beautifully applied by, the outcome of them is, is applied by you according to the goodness of your will for our lives. Thank you. These simple truths. Thank you that your promises are enough. We don't need anything else to do what you've told us to do. We just need your promise. And that's good enough. And we will succeed. Folks, as we close today, I just want you to maybe just take this out of the academic realm, if you will. And let it do a journey from your head to your heart. It's only 18 inches from here to here. And won't you look at your own life and see if you are indeed standing firm. If you are Hey, that's wonderful. Keep standing. Maybe there are some of you who are just learning about this and you're enthused by what we've been speaking about. Say, now I know what to do. Now I know what stance to take. I know what armor to put on. I know how to be relaxed in my mind to know that I will win this battle. I know what the substance is. It's the character of God. It's the promises of God. It's the principle. I know what to do. Leave it to me. I know what to do. If that is you, then I trust that you will do that this week and make this a real emphasis and intentional about it but maybe today you might be one who's looking at this and saying man the poiki pot that is my life is lying on its side it has fallen over well i want to tell you today pick it up again for goodness sake stop lying there bemoaning your fate Pick it up and say to God, God, is it okay if I start this again? If, is it okay if I, if I build now, if I can restore my porcupine that is my life, if I can restore it to understanding the person of you are, who you are, and the beauty of your promises and the wonder of the principles that are applied by your goodness. God, I want to move out from church today and do just that. If that is you, then my prayer for you is you, that you will be courageous. Pick yourself up. Dust yourself off. And begin to stand firm in all that we have spoken about today. God, you've heard our prayer. We cannot fool you. You're omniscient. You know everything. And I pray that we would do justice to what it means to stand firm in our faith. Help us, we pray, in Jesus' name. Amen.